to read 1 John chapter 5, just two verses of scripture here. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. I want to preach to you for just a little bit today. This kind of titled text, I'm going to call this, It's Time for Me to be anointed. I want you to say it out loud. It's time for me to be anointed. Come on, say it real big. It's time for me to be anointed. Doesn't it feel good when you say that? So before you sit down, get used to confessing it. Just tell somebody around you before you sit down. It's time for me to be anointed. God bless you. Thank you, guys. God bless you. You may be seated. It's time for me to be anointed. You've been a lot of things, but it's time to be anointed. And it's time for it. It's time for it. The anointing makes it easier for you to do whatever it is you have to do. It's time for you to be anointed. You've been doing it anyway. You might as well be anointed while you're doing it. It's time for you to be anointed, whatever it is that you're doing. It's time for you to be an anointed husband, anointed wife, anointed worker, anointed parent, anointed student, anointed business owner, anointed bookkeeper, anointed something, whatever you're doing. It's time to be anointed. Going through Orlando traffic, you should be anointed. It's time for me to be anointed. It's time for me to be anointed. It's time to be anointed. I was thinking about this, uh, this understanding of truth. The understanding of truth is we, under, we should know that truth is objective. Truth is objective. It doesn't really, it's not really based on how you feel about it. It's true. Truth is not what we want it to be. Truth is what it is. And truth is truth at all times to all people. It's just true. It's what truth is. And um, the thing that, the, the battle sometimes that we don't know how to negotiate with truth is that it is possible for more than one thing to be true at the same time. It doesn't change the truth. It just means that it's possible for one, more than one thing to be true at the same time. So it is true that I am a husband. That's true. That's true. Verifiable evidence of that. 39 years. I am a husband. And so that's true. I'm also a father. Verifiable evidence of that as well. Two children. Kathy and I have. So the fact that I am a husband is true. If I need to back up on that, the fact that I am a male is true. Just thought I'd point that out. That's true. And so I am a husband, which is also true. I am a father, which is also true. Those three things are all true at the same time. Walk with me. I am a grandfather. Okay, I got three grandboys. Kathy and I have three grandchildren. We're going to watch them in the month of May for a while. <laughs> Y'all pray my strength in the Lord. <laughs> they wake up, they wake up on fire, bro. They wake up on fire. Seven, right? Six, seven, I get seven four and three. Thank you. I, I need to get home. I, I need to get on home. Seven, four, and three. So I'm a male. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. 
All of those things are true. So more than one thing can be true at the same time. The interesting thing about truth is that though more than one thing can be true at the same time, they do not always have the same priority at the same time. So sometimes in dealing with the way that God moves with us is we don't always know how to coordinate ourselves because we don't know what truth is being emphasized at a particular time. So when Kathy and I are out on a date night, the most important truth at that moment is that I am a husband. <laughs> in May... When Phil and Meredith go on vacation and we have the grandbabies, the grandboys, then when I'm with them, I am still a husband, but there will be moments when the most emphasized truth will be that I am a grandparent. Are you with me? This, this has something to do with how we navigate what God is doing in our lives because we don't always know which truth is being emphasized if we don't know that the importance of the truth that we know is also connected to which truth God is emphasizing in our life at that particular time. Walk with me for just a minute now because uh, the law of gravity is true. It is true to all people. It is true in all places. It is true in all times. It is true. Gravity. Gravity is true. You can't get away from it. You can't escape it. Doesn't matter how you feel about it. Doesn't matter what continent you live on. Doesn't matter what gender, gender you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. Gravity is true. The law of lift is true. Gravity has to do with weight. Everything pulls towards the center of the earth. And the weight increases the power of gravity upon that thing. I'm not going to give you a physics lesson. The, the law of lift is how airplanes work. It's based on thrust. It's based on moving at a 45-degree angle. And the fact that gravity is there actually works to cause lift to happen. Both things are true. Are you with me? But there... But the importance of those truths depend on where I'm at at the moment. If I am walking across a narrow tightrope suspended between two buildings, the most important truth at that moment is gravity. If I am boarding an airplane to get from Florida to Ohio, the most important truth for me is lift. There are truths in the Bible. Let's, let's see how we do. There is power in your shout. Is that true? There is power in your shout. Shout will bring walls down. Shouts will will run demonic powers away. There is power. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Shouting will take me to a victory that is already won before I get there. There is power in a shout. That is true. Somebody say yes. There's power in a shout. There's power in silence. If you don't know which truth is the most important based on where you're at, you're going to shout when you should be quiet. All the men say amen. amen. There are moments to be silent and moments to shout. There's power in silence. Sometimes at a, at a gathering event, especially if we are honoring either someone who is uh, a hero or someone who is dead or fallen people or, or, or a national tragedy. Sometimes they will ask the audience to have a moment of silence. 
It's not appropriate to shout. And that silence is powerful. There are times when a shout is appropriate. And there's power in that shout. It, the, both things are true. But the truth that is emphasized is based on its timing. The Bible talks about moving forward and marching. There's power in being able to move forward. Forward is the direction of your life. Have you noticed that God very seldomly speaks to us about going backward? I can't even really think of a verse right now about going back words going backward he's always moving forward follow me and so forward is the motion of faith and so now we there's power in moving forward there was power in pursuing there was power in marching there was power in all of that and yet the truth is that sometimes the bible says stand still and see the salvation of God. Both things are true. If you move forward too fast, you get to where you're going before you're ready for it. If you stand still too long, your window of opportunity closes before you can get there to it. Both are true. Both things true at the same time but the truth that is emphasized is based on its timing. I think this is important because when we talk about the time to be anointed, then things are true in the scripture. But if we don't know our timing, we don't know what to do, and we have truths that are not competing, they don't negate each other. We just don't know which one to emphasize. We don't know what truth to emphasize when we don't know what time it is. What we do know is that I have to agree with the truth in my time for me to receive what it's supposed to be. Here we go. There are three that agree in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. These three agree, and these three are one there is an unbroken eternal agreement in the heavens the father the word and the spirit have an unbroken always agreement there is nothing that is ever done that causes division disagreement discord contradiction they are in agreement. These three, they are one. Therefore, you have to be in agreement with the truth, consistent with the moment, so you know which one to emphasize. Yeah. There are three that agree in the earth, and that is the spirit and the blood and the water. These three agree. Since there is an unbroken agreement in the heavens for us to access the truth in our moment, we have to agree in the earth. If any two of you shall agree on earth, then heaven will respond to that. Somebody say, I hear you. You got to walk with me for just a minute now to understand that heaven is a responsive place. Since heaven is permanently in agreement. You, there's nothing that you can do to break the agreement that is in heaven. These three agree, and they are one. Therefore, the earth, the actions of the earth cause the heavens to come into a responsive state to what we do. Therefore, we have to bring ourselves into agreement with an unbroken agreement to receive the blessings of heaven upon the earth because the heavens are not going to change their agreement based on how you want it to be because these three, they agree 
and they are one. Are you tracking with me? All right, let me walk it out for you this way. So, it doesn't take very long in the scripture to see that there is an agreement between heavens and earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If we take it, understanding that the heavens are in agreement, that the earth's responsibility is to be in agreement with heaven, and that the heavens respond to the agreement of the earth. God creates, watch me, God creates water. Still in Genesis 1. God creates waters. He creates, watch how the Bible says it. The waters above, he separates the waters above from the waters below. Have y'all read? It's, that's the first book in your Bible. <laughs> in the first chapter of your Bible. He creates the waters above. Everybody say waters above. Waters above. And then he creates the waters below. Say waters below. And he separates the, the waters above and the waters below by what King James calls a firmament, what we call an atmosphere. Waters above and waters below. Now watch this, because we understand then that beginning in Genesis, we enter a season of the water. We enter a season of the water because when the earth is without form and void and chaos is upon the earth, the Spirit of God, I heard somebody singing about it today, the Spirit of God hovers over the face of the waters. It does not hover over the land because the land gives no reflection. When God deals with the earth, He wants to see His reflection in the earth indicating that there is some agreement there. When you look in the mirror, if you see somebody else's reflection, you need to call a priest. So what you see the reflection of tells you that something is in alignment. Something is in agreement. And so the Spirit of God does not hover over the face of the land because the land does not give reflection, the land gives shadow. He hovers over the face of the waters. And now he has the waters above and the waters below that are separated by an atmosphere. Watch me. Therefore, the waters above respond to the waters below. If the waters below come into agreement with the waters above, then the waters above will release what heaven has for the people. Both things are true. They are both waters. But you have to know which one is being emphasized at any given time. We know this because Genesis teaches us then that God has not let there be rain upon the earth because he did not have anyone on the earth to till the garden. But there was a mist that went up from the earth to water the earth. But the waters above were not responding to the waters below because there was no one there to govern it. So it is the season of the waters. And so you could track with that. By the time we get 10 generations later to Noah, Noah now is dealing with an earth where the thoughts of all mankind have become upon evil continually to the point that God said, I need to start this thing over. And so he speaks to Noah and says to Noah, you know the story, build the ark, it's going to rain. Everybody say, water's above, water's below. So Genesis tells us in the 600th year of Noah's life, second month, 17th day. I don't know, after you live for 600 years, why are we counting months and days? I don't know, it's all the same. But it's recorded that way. 600 year, second month, 17th day of Noah's life. Watch this now. It does not say it began to rain. It said the fountains of the deep broke. And when the fountains of the deep broke, then the waters in the heavens came down. The heavens responded to the earth. Waters above, waters below. But since heaven is a responsive place, 
when the fountains of the deep broke, then the rain from the heavens came. It is the season of the waters. Yeah, here we go. It's the season of the waters. I don't know how far we have to go with it, but you got to see that Moses has the children of Israel, and they come out of ten mighty plagues, and they come to the Red Sea. And because it is the season of the water, God indicates that something is going to happen in the heavens if the waters will respond. And so Moses stands in front of the Red Sea, and the Red Sea parts open. Children of Israel go through on dry ground, and Pharaoh and the horses are drowned in the sea because the waters cooperate with the man who is an authority upon the earth because it is the season of the waters. Keep walking with me because you've got to get to where you're going by going through the Jordan. And the Jordan is the passing by because the water below is the indication that God is dealing with the earth specifically, truthfully, in that time by emphasizing the truth that the waters below indicate what the heavens will do. And so therefore, it is the crossing of the Jordan to indicate that you will go into a new land of promise. It is the dealing with the waters above from, the, from below with the prophet Elijah who says to Ahab and Jezebel, the heavens will not respond to you. The heavens will close up. The waters above will not respond to those who are below until I say so. And to release that waters from above, Elijah gets all the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel. And after all of the, all of the prayers of the false prophets and all of those things, which you guys already know about, what Elijah does is says, go get me four barrels of water. Because if I release waters below, then the waters above, the heavens will respond to it. And when he pours the waters below, the fire falls, and then he says, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. It is the season of the waters. And so you can track with it. You can track with it. Naaman going into the water and the, and, and the axe head floating in the water. It is the season of the water, which is the truth of the indication that God is emphasizing a truth to let you know something. Here we go. When Jesus comes into the earth, Jesus comes into the earth, and Jesus comes now to emphasize. That's why I want to be clear about this. To emphasize another truth. It is not at odds with the previous truth. It is another truth that takes emphasis based on the time. But to emphasize the new truth, he has to fulfill the old truth. It's going to make sense in a minute. Jesus comes to put punctuation on the season of the water Jesus comes into the earth and now he finds himself at John John is baptizing in the same place Jordan John's message is connected to the water because John was born under the emphasis of the season of the water and so Jesus comes and he says to John, I want to be baptized. John says, no, it would be better for you to be baptizing me. But watch this now. Jesus knows and teaches us later, according to Luke 16, 16 that amongst those born of women, there's none greater than John. John is the highest ranking person on the earth during the time of Jesus' birth. Jesus has not yet started his ministry. So in order, what did Jesus say? In order to fulfill all righteousness. The right thing for Jesus to do is to allow the last emphasis to release the new emphasis. So to punctuate that, Jesus comes up under John. Watch what John does. Jesus goes into the water. The waters now, as Jesus comes out of the water, there comes a voice out of heaven. 
This is my son. The spirit descends like a dove. And the word is coming up out of the water. Indicating that there are three in heaven that do agree. And these three, they are one. And they are the father, the word, and the spirit. And in the earth, there are three that agree. And they are the water, and the blood, and the spirit. And so now Jesus comes up showing that there is an agreement. And now he has to punctuate the season. To understand that the three in heaven have authority over what truth is being emphasized. Jesus does not come to negate the truth of the season of the water. He comes to fulfill it. Fulfilling something is not to disregard it. It is to realize when its moment is being superseded by another truth that is being emphasized. You got to walk with me. Jesus comes to move from, we're talking about the earth now, the three that agree, the spirit, the blood, and the water. Jesus comes now to introduce to us the season and the truth of the blood. But the blood cannot be emphasized until the season of the water is fulfilled and punctuated. Therefore, Jesus comes and begins in the water and he walks and his first miracle, his first miracle is taking the water and turning the water into wine, which is the indication that the season of the water is about to change because wine represents the blood. And so now Jesus is indicating it. So throughout his life now, Jesus comes to the pool of Bethesda because they're used to the season of the water. They're used to the season of the water and they're waiting for an angel to come down and trouble the water. And the man is sitting there and he said, I've been here for all these years, and, but somebody always beats me into the water. And Jesus stands there and says, why are you waiting on the water? Oh, that's right. You were born under the season of the water. And though it is true, there is another truth coming to you that is going to be emphasized in another season but you don't understand the blood yet so let me just explain a few things to you why don't you just get up and walk instead of waiting for the water because something greater than the water is coming up on you and it's called the blood and so now Jesus begins to introduce the season of the blood, but he's got to settle the issue with the water. And so now he comes walking to his disciples, but he's going to walk on the water. He's walking on the water, indicating that I'm greater than the water. The wine is greater than the water. The blood is greater than the water. The word is greater than the water. The water is true, and the water is right, but there is another truth that is coming. And if you emphasize the water when you should emphasize the blood, you're going to miss the moment that you're supposed to be in because you don't know what time it is because you got locked into one truth. Oh, my goodness. And so now Jesus comes and starts dealing with them in, in all the water. But now Jesus says, I've come, I've come, but the blood cannot start until the water is settled. That issue, not that it is done away with, but that it is fulfilled. Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. It doesn't mean that it wasn't true. It doesn't mean that there's not truth in it. It means if you emphasize what was over the truth of what is, then you get stuck in a yesterday thing rather than moving in your moment right now. It's called arrested development as it relates. When you still act like a teenager and you're a 30-year-old man, it's still true that you're a man, but you got stuck in a yesterday's truth. There are things that teenagers do that adults don't do somebody say yes there are things that single people do that married people don't do y'all got quiet on me in here you got to know what time and what season you're in Jesus begins now to give indication when he goes to Gethsemane and he prays and he prays and his sweat becomes as drops of blood. He prays so hard, indicating that he's come to introduce another truth to you that you may not have known. It doesn't change water from being H2O. It doesn't change water from baptism. It doesn't change water from being necessary for human or natural life. It doesn't, it doesn't change water from making you wet. It doesn't change water from anything. All it does is says there's another truth that you don't know, that there is power, wonder-working power 
in the precious blood of the Lamb. And you have not known this truth. You have heard it said to you before, but now I say unto you. And Jesus is indicating that the blood is coming, and he begins to shed it early on his prayers in Gethsemane. And all through his life, you see the blood. And when Jesus is on the cross, come on. When Jesus is on the cross, we sang about it half of our life and don't even know what it means. That it was on the cross that Jesus shed his blood for us. It was the blood of the Lamb that was shed for us that took care of our what the water could not do it was true that you could be baptized for the remission the remission of sin uh, the, the water can cleanse you but it cannot change you but the blood can change you because it is true that you need to be baptized, but you've got to receive the blood. And so the blood is a truth, and Jesus comes to initiate the season of the blood so that everybody knows that you've got to have more than just the water because there are three in heaven that agree, and they are the Father and the Word and the Spirit. And there are three up on the earth that agree, and it is the Spirit, and it is the water, and it is the blood. And Jesus comes to initiate the season of the blood. And when Jesus resurrects from the dead, from that time forward, now everybody knows that to come to God, you got to come in through the blood. You got to come in through the blood, and the truth of the water then takes its proper position, which is not over the blood, it is after the blood. When you receive the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you signify it by going into baptism. And the water is always true, but the blood is true as well. But they are not equally true because of the time that we are in. Jesus resurrects from the dead and is upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Don't you know that drove people crazy? The ones that crucified him, the ones that told everybody, no, that was a, somebody stole his body and all that. He wouldn't go away. He didn't leave. He hung out for 40 days and 40 nights, teaching and appearing before large crowds of people. When is he getting up out of here? Jesus is walking around for 40 days, and before he leaves, he tells his disciples, I need you to go into an upper room, and I want you to wait there because you know a certain amount of truth but you don't know all the truth that's what you have to know about walking with God what you may know is true but it's not the only truth that there is to know and to walk with God you have to know which truth is being emphasized at the time that you're in so you know which truth to prioritize in your life which does not negate the former truth it only lets you know which truth is applying to you in the time that you're in go into an upper room and when you get into that upper room, then you're going to wait to be endued with power from on high. They got so mesmerized on the, as Jesus was ascending into heaven. They got so mesmerized looking up that Jesus finally, the angel said to them, Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? I thought you were told to go to an upper room someplace and wait for the power. Wait for the power. They get into the upper room. Watch me now because the words are important. They were in the same place of the same mind, same accord, they were in agreement. Because there's something about agreement on the earth that causes a response in the heavens. Water's below, water's above. And now the people below are coming into agreement. There are three that agree in heaven. It is the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And we had heard from the Father. Now he's hearing from the Word. And now we're getting ready to hear from the Spirit. And there are three that agree in the earth, and it is the Spirit and the water and the blood. And so we had the season of the water. Jesus came to introduce the season of the blood. The only two that are mentioned, the two that are mentioned specifically in the way that they're mentioned is the Spirit. And now they come into an upper room and they come together in one time, in one place, of one accord and one mind. And I could almost hear the Father saying, it's time for you to be anointed. You've been baptized. You've been saved. You've been washed in the blood. 
You've been under the baptismal waters. The world has had the season of the water. Jesus came to introduce the season of the blood. And now on Pentecost, he said, it's time for you to be anointed. So that you know that what the water cannot do for you, so you know that when you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, that you have something now that is different than what other people in other times had. That you are able to stand with assuredly and say, it is not by might. It is not by power, but it is by the Spirit of God. I'm trying to get you to a place here this morning because I want to I want to touch and agree with every person. I'm gonna get some oil in just a minute, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mess up your Sunday clothes, and I'm not gonna mess up your hair, and I'm not gonna put grease on everything. But I'm gonna I'm gonna touch and agree with you more more as symbol than just trying to lay hands and pray on everybody. I want to touch I want to touch you so that we have a moment to realize that that all this time. That pastor has been talking to us about the oil. And it's been an oily. I mean, some of y'all are ready for a deep fryer. You know, I mean, it's been oil. It's been oil. And it becomes so much a part of our language that we understand. We say that's that, that song was oily. That message was oily. And what we mean by that is it was anointed. That's what we mean by that. We mean that to, to, to be anointed means there are things that are hard for some people to do, things that have been hard for you to do in previous seasons. But once you become anointed, it becomes easier for you to do the same things that you had to do when the anointing and the oil is moving in your life. And I want you to understand this, this, this powerful understanding that when they got together, in agreement in the upper room, watch what happens. Their agreement produced a response in heaven. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, the time changed. When the time, what? Time changed, Sunday. I know, I just, I just blessed myself right there. I'm going to I'm gonna have to give myself a little offering right there. I don't know, something just, something just happened. When the time changed, when that time changed, the day of Pentecost was fully come. When the time changes for a, a truth to be emphasized, it must find agreement in the earth for the heaven to respond. And over all of the earth, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there was one place where people had gathered together in the one place of the same mind and the same heart that had come into agreement and the heavens responded to the agreement that was upon the earth and there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. Cloven tongues of fire set upon each of their heads. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues and they walked out of that room into the streets of Jerusalem and from that day until this day, we live in a season not of the water. We live in a season of the Spirit. It doesn't mean that the water is no longer true. Of course, the power of the blood is forever. Jesus came to save you, but he also came to fill you. He came to fill you so that you can say, I am saved. I am baptized. Yes, I am, but it's time for me to be anointed. It's time for me to take the Spirit of God with me wherever I go. Whatever I need to do, however I need to do it, it is time for me to be anointed. What is going on in our lives? It would be easier if we learn how to be anointed when we did it. I grew up in, 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 in a church world where where especially the elders, elderly, seasoned saints of our churches were very concerned with whether or not you were anointed. They were not impressed with talent, not impressed with your gifts, not impressed with your abilities. And back in that day, I don't know how many of you can, can go back this far with me, but during back in those days, they didn't have like a, like a meeting on Tuesday to reevaluate what you did on Sunday. 
they did it right there on the spot and if you got up in front of people and you were talking preaching singing testifying or giving announcements it didn't matter what you was doing if you kind of got out of you out of the space of the anointing you could expect somebody to walk up and, and pull on your elbow and pull you back that's how they did that just so that you knew that everybody else knew you wasn't anointed I, I feel the questions yes I have been my elbow had been pulled on but I'm going to tell you what somebody walks out on you and pulls on you and said baby that was good that's good but you need to get into the anointing when they say that to you and just leave you set that it ain't like today that ain't a three week counseling session about how you feel about it and you know, all, no, it, it, that's that's a, you just receive that right there. You receive that right, and they let you work on that. But I'm gonna tell you what it does. Next time you came up, next time you were supposed to get that microphone, you was on a fast. You laid, you shut the TV off. You laid on the floor because the worst thing you wanted to happen was some mother of the church to walk up and pull your elbow and call you out in front of everybody. It produced in me an understanding of what it means to be anointed. But sometimes we think anointing is only for the sacred work of what happens within the confines of a building. It only happens to fivefold ministry. It only happens to people who are staff at the church. It only happens. But there is an anointing. I have watched over the years people whose main giftings and callings are to take pictures or run cameras and see pictures that capture a moment that when you see it, it stirs something on the inside of you. I have seen ushers remove a spirit of heaviness off of someone who walked up into a church building and felt like everything was, and somehow by the way that they greeted them and seated them and dealt with them, that that spirit of heaviness left up off of them. I have watched children lead their families to Christ because they had a children's teacher that wrapped them around the anointing of God and put so much in them that the parents could see a problem child turn into a prophetic child. I have watched the anointing of God move throughout the lives of God's people. I have seen anointed school teachers that went to school early and put oil over the doorpost of their classroom and walk up and down the aisles of their own rooms and though they may not be able legally or whatever to to call Jesus' name out in front of everybody. They got up in that room and turned it into their sanctuary and bound every demonic spirit and bound every lie of the devil. And children that had lived in environments where the parents were fighting each other, where there was domestic abuse going on, where there was drug abuse going on, where they got up and got themselves dressed and had to make their own little breakfast or came without breakfast, walked up into a classroom that they couldn't not define the difference but that the spirit of God was there and safety was there and love was there I have seen anointed people that dealt with whatever occupation they have in life that because they were there something separated them and made a difference because when they came into an agreement with the heavens because they said there are three that in heaven that agree and it is the father the word and it is the spirit and there are three that agree on earth and they are one and it is the spirit and it is the water and it is the blood and I'm standing right there with them and I agree with heaven and I agree with the earth and therefore when I pray thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven I realize that I'm living in the season of the spirit brothers and sisters brothers and sisters it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out of my spirit up on all flesh he said that we are in this time of the spirit this is what Joel prophesied that the spirit of God would begin to be poured out upon all people and we are seeing in our day I know that what the world is doing and I know that gross darkness is filling the earth I know that but the Bible said when you see gross darkness it's time for you to arise and shine for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you 
And I believe that we are living in time when God is giving us the truth and emphasizing the truth of the power of the Spirit in our lives. And we've been watching, have we not? With People may have different opinions, but we've been watching throughout the land of things happening on college campuses uh, where it's almost like the Spirit was just being poured out and is being poured out. And I say, hallelujah. Somebody say, I don't know about all that. You don't know about a lot of stuff. I ain't worried about you. I was going to say, hallelujah. You don't even know how to run your remote control i'm hallelujah praise the lord i let let the spirit uh, it's amazing that you can live in a nation where if there's a school shooting they want us to pray any other time you ain't supposed to pray let somebody get shot then they then that now they want everybody to pray but then when the holy ghost gets poured out people start praying and we got half the christians going like well i'm not so sure about you ain't sure about a lot of stuff you need to know what season that we're in we are in the season of the emphasizing that the spirit of god cannot be blocked out ah, the spirit of god cannot be voted out the spirit of god cannot be locked out the spirit of god cannot not be pushed out the spirit of God will be poured out upon all flesh and we are in the times of the spirit and I I, I say to you that you got to sensitize yourself to the truth you got to sensitize your, yourself to the truth that what is being emphasized in our time and in our day is not your talent is not your church affiliation in sense of denominations and all of those things it is it, it, it is it, it is not the way you used to do it it's not what's being emphasized Denominations are not being emphasized. The Holy Ghost will jump up out of your so-called Pentecostal self and show up someplace else if you get stuck in a season that God is not moving in. You got to realize that the Spirit is being poured out. We got to have more than cute sermons. We got to have more than, than cute songs. We got to have more than just people who show up to church to check a box for the out there week because this is the time when the Spirit is moving up on the lands. And I want to say hallelujah because God lets you live to see this moment you're about ready to see the spirit of God poured out because it's time for you to be anointed it's time for you to do the same stuff you had to do and the, it used to wear you out but now you get ready to have victory in it now you get ready to have joy in it now you get ready to have family salvation in it now you get ready to have double breakthrough in it because there's an anointing that's coming into your life an anointing coming into your life. And I'm praying over you on this day. Praying, yeah, just stick with me a little bit. Come on, come on, just let's just, let's just be anointed. Let's just be anointed. If you're not anointed, I'm gonna come over here and pull on you. <laughs> they was rough on us, boy. They was, you know about all that. They was rough on us. They would sit you down in a minute. Tell you, okay, you come back later. Don't worry, we, we, we're in a different season. <laughs> I want your heart and your faith to move in such a way that maybe you could just sense, see, feel, or hear how everything could change by the anointing. By rather than being responsive and reflexive habitually as a parent when, when you want to do the same thing all the time, respond the same way all the time, use the same tone all the time that's, that you could feel the anointing and know what to do, what to say how to say it what move to make that would change something your wife and you're trying to get your husband to have sense I say it that way because that seemed like to be I don't know too many men are not always like you know we're not trying to get our wives to have sense we're just trying to have the sense to figure out how to walk with them we ain't, I mean you know <laughs> the difference between men and women we don't have no talk shows on TV about men sitting around talking about women because we get it that we don't get it we're good with that we ain't trying to figure it all out. We know that's a that's a futile effort. 
That's not our call to figure out. Figure out. But, but you have the talk shows on TV, and all, a bunch of women sit around talking about men. This is what men do, the men do that. Okay, that's the difference. But anyway, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know why you're so mad. You, I don't know why you're mad. But could you imagine if we related to each other rather than trying to figure just, you know, understanding is different than figuring out. We should understand each other know one another but you're figuring people out you know you're trying to figure someone out that's trying to figure themselves out half the time so but what about understanding and just saying how does the anointing convey into this sometimes the way someone is acting or responding or saying or doing or whatever has to do with something that the anointing could fix the anointing could heal the anointing could change I want to pray that an unusual anointing will come upon you from this day forward. Whew. Have you ever had a conversation, a coffee, a lunch, or maybe in a phone conversation with a friend or someone, and you realize somewhere in it that you're in the middle of an anointed conversation? And how much different your day was because that conversation was anointed. You just started off by talking about, hey, what's happening? What? And all of a sudden, it just kind of went into a direction. And you realized God was in that moment. I think being aware to the fact that you are in a time of the Spirit will help us to be more sensitive to it because we expect it. We expect that today, somewhere, the anointing is on me. The anointing is in me. I can do this because it's time for me to be anointed. It's time for me to rise up in my anointing. It's time for the season of anointing to begin to flow in our churches. It's time for us not to come to church. Our churches all across our land and all across the world the saints of God come to church and expect the anointing to flow. Expect for a word to be spoken that's going to be like quick and powerful. Expect for worship to take us into the glories and into the praise and into the victories. And expect the, expect the gathering and the prayers of the saints to heal the sick and the blessed and the lost to be saved. Because we know that our truth that is being emphasized is that we are in the season of the Spirit and it's time for us to be anointed. Stand with me just one moment. Will you, wherever you're at, hands are lifted all over the building. Spirit of the living God, every heart, every mind, every dad, every mom, every son and daughter, male, father, parent, grandparent, mom, aunt, uncle, employee, employer, student, teacher. Fill us. Flow through us. Let us know it is our time to be anointed. We've done it by ourselves. We've done it laboring. We've done it dutifully. We've done it faithfully. We've done it the best we know how. But it's time to be anointed. From this day, I pray over this house a peculiar increase of anointing. Before we pray for ourselves, we lift up our pastors, Jonathan and Christina. Thank you, Lord, for them. Thank you for their life. Thank you for their family. Increase, increase, increase anointing upon them and all that their hands are to, and all the vision that's in their heart, everything that you put before them, increase anointing, increase 
anointing upon their life. Increase the anointing upon this church. Increase the anointing upon everything. I want to have the boldness to pray this prayer that you increase the anointing all throughout the land of our country. Of course, globally, but specifically today, we call out, we call out our land. And we ask you to pour your spirit upon our land. Holy Spirit, heal our land. Holy Spirit, rain on our fields. Pour out the Holy Spirit upon our sons and our daughters and let them prophesy. Let them prophesy in the streets. Let them prophesy. Pour out your spirit in coffee shops and in movie theaters and in college campuses and in classrooms. And spirit of the living God, fall and do a work in our day that would cause your name to be glorified in the middle of all kinds of things. We lift you up, and we glorify you. We magnify you. Let our King be lifted up. Let our